Welcome to this lecture on increased intracranial pressure. This particular lecture will firstly focus on what intracranial pressure is, what are some of the reasons for it to increase, and what are the clinical manifestations that come about when it increases and their general mechanism. So let's start by looking at this image. I know it's very schematic, but I'm not a very good drawer. So firstly, we've got the outside black line, which is going to be the skull. And so the skull encompasses the brain. So we can see the brain located inside the skull or the cranium. Now the brain is held within the whole the vault of the, of the skull and it goes down into the spinal cord. We can see the blood vessels coming in and so again they're very schematic, this is not anatomically correct, but it's just illustrating the arterial blood coming in, supplying the brain tissue through its capillary network and then leaving the brain via the venous fluid. And then finally in, in yellow in here is the CSF and this is the fluid that surrounds the brain and um, allows the brain to be buoyant and um, sit and floats within it. And so what we can see from this, uh, that there's three main volumes within the, the, the cranium itself. We've got the brain, we've got the blood, and we've got the CSF. And this gives you three components that make up what is encompassed within the cranial cavity itself. So let's start with the brain. The volume of the brain, because we know the brain weighs about um, 1,300 grams to 1,500 grams, the volume basically is that. So it is 1,300 mils of volume. Now when we look at the CSF, the CSF takes up, or oh, it's approximately 130 mils of fluid. And this is all around the brain going down to the spinal cord where it travels down and comes back up and then gets reabsorbed into the dural sinuses. And then finally, the, the blood itself is about also about 130 mils of volume. And so these are the three volumes within the cranium. And this gives us what we call, it's a, it's a term that we call the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, which basically says if any one of those three components increase in size, the intracranial pressure will increase with it. And so let's have a look at a formula that we work at to try and figure out the ICP. So firstly we need to figure out what is the pressure required to perfuse the brain. So this is cerebral perfusion pressure or CCP and this equals the MAP, the mean arterial pressure, minus the intracranial pressure and this is the one we're going to focus on mostly today. Now the CCP has to be in a certain range to give your neurons and your cells in your brain enough oxygen and nutrients to survive. So this has to be maintained at a certain rate. When we look at MA, MAP, so this is the fluid, this is the pressure, the mean arterial pressure that's coming into the brain. And we know that the mean arterial pressure equals one third of the pulse pressure plus the diastole, the diastolic pressure. So if we were to assume just a standard BP of 120 over 80, um, the pulse pressure is going to be then 40 and a third of 40 is about 12. Now when you plus the diastole of 80, we can see that we're about sitting in the range of 90 millimetres. So the MAP should be in that kind of range of 90 or that 65 to 110 is a normal range of MAP. In terms of intracranial pressure, this is the pressure out here in the CSF. Well the easy way I remember it is 130 mils. Well, the pressure, so if you were to put a gauge into here, the pressure would be also 130 millimetres, but of water. Now, when you translate that to millimetres of mercury, it's going to be about 7 to 15 millimetres of mercury. Okay, let's just say 10. And so that 90 minus 10 is going to give you a, a cerebral perfusion pressure of, let's say, 80. And the normal range is about 60 to 80. That is millimetres of mercury. That is what's required to perfuse your head. And so in today's context, if this number starts to increase and get closer to the MAP, that means this number will drop. Okay, and if this number goes down, 
your brain isn't being perfused, therefore your brain's not going to be working very well and there's going to be problems. So before we jump into ICP, so we now know what intracranial pressure is, it's essentially the pressure outside and that's generally sitting with the CSF and, that, and the pressure itself is normally 7 to 15 millimetres of mercury. But what are the things that are likely to increase it? So firstly, let's work off the Munro-Kelly hypothesis or doctrine and it's basically saying if any one of those three things increase, this is going to increase. So what's going to increase the mass of the brain? Well, if you have tumours in your brain, if you have abscesses in your brain, if you have edema in your brain, or if you have bleeding into the brain tissue itself, this is going to increase the volume, which means the skull can't expand. That means the ICP goes up. So that's brain volume increase. What increases the CSF volume? Well, the CSF is made at about half a mil per minute in your brain, which means approximately per day you're you've got about 500 mils production of CSF. But we know there's 130 mils, so that means there has to be a lot of recycling. Now in the ventricles of your brain, we have a choroid plexus that creates the CSF, and that hopefully then cycles through the ventricles, down into the third ventricle, into, down into the brainstem, and then goes down, comes back up, and then gets recycled or reabsorbed into the dural sinus, which then goes into the venous system. Now, if there's too much CSF made, such as a tumour in the choroid plexus, CSF will go up. Or if there's a blockage somewhere, it's not being drained away, the CSF increases, therefore so does the ICP. And then finally, what would increase the, flu the, the blood flow into the brain? Well, if you had a person who had heart failure, their increased um, central venous pressure will increase, which means the total amount of blood in the cranium will increase, that will go up, so will the ICP. Another maybe reason would be uh, if you have a person who's high in carbon dioxide or hypercapnia, their arterials in the, the brain would increase in size, therefore the volume increases, therefore the ICP increases. So hopefully now we've seen what ICP is and what are some of the causes um, to increase it through the, um, the Munro-Kelly doctrine. So now we're going to move to how does the the person present when this number goes up. So when your intracranial pressure starts to increase, how might, you know, how, how might you know that your patient has that? Well, this goes across to the clinical manifestations. So, some of the most common signs and symptoms that go with an increased intracranial pressure are, well, firstly, you will have a drop in GCS and that's the Glasgow Coma Scale. This is given an indication of brain function. So if you are becoming, if this is increasing closer to this, that means this number drops, that means the brain's not getting a good amount of oxygen, you would expect the GCS to, to drop. So GCS is a good indication of the brain function. So that's one. The next thing would be um, headaches. So head aches. Now why would this happen? Well, as the the pressure increases, you've got coverings around the brain, okay, these are called your meninges, um, we've got pia, arachnoid dura, that would start to get stretched, the meninges are highly sensitive to pain, so that's going to stretch them, cause a headache. Now, particularly, if the headache is present in the morning, so you've, you've slept horizontal for a long period of time, let's say six to eight hours, we haven't got the gravity to move the CSF around, so the CSF starts to increase, intracranial pressure starts to increase, expand the meninges. So if the person wakes up in the morning with a, a headache, a throbbing headache, that's a bad sign that possibly the ICP is increasing. So headaches, not good, and that's the reason because the meninges swelling. The next one is vomiting. So vomiting. Now the reason why this is, comes about, well, as the, the pressure increases, particularly coming off, so here's your pons, here's your medulla, you've got a nerve coming off that goes down to your heart, your lungs, your GIT, this is your vagus nerve. Now that gets pressed on when we have an increased ICP, so if the vagus get irritated, we know it's parasympathetic and we know that it innervates the stomach and so too much drive to the stomach can cause vomiting. 
but not only normal vomiting, but projectile vomiting. So if a patient has projectile vomiting, that's also a sign of intracranial pressure increase. The next one is papilla edema. So this is essentially swelling of the optic disc, okay? So papilla edema is, we've got here, we've got the eye, okay? Again, it's schematic, it's not accurate. Optic nerve coming from the cerebrum, coming into the back of the eye, and there we've got the optic discs. As the ICP increases, the arterial blood flow to the eye appears to be okay because arterial is higher, but venous drainage is a problem because the ICP is increasing, so the venous drainage isn't draining. So that for the, on the inside where the optic nerve comes into the retina, where you have a disc, nice round disc, it starts to become um, swollen. And so if you look into a person's eye through their pupil to the back of the eye where you find the optic disc, normally should be nice and circular, but if that starts to become blurred, this is indication of papilla edema, which is indication of ICP, and the reason is because the venous drainage is starting to drop and that becomes swollen. So the papilla edema is another one. Uh, we're, so we're left, so we've done headache, papilla edema, vomiting, drop in GCS. So we're less, left now with what we call the Cushing reflex. And this is probably one of the most important ones to get your head around. So this is named after the physician Harvin Cushing. And so what this is essentially saying, or sometimes it's also called the triad because there's three components on it. And the three components is a high blood pressure, a low heart rate, and an in irregular breathing. So let's just wrap our heads around this and why it comes about, because it seems somewhat counterintuitive. Well, as the intracranial pressure increases, which approaches the MAP, the CPP drops, so the brain's not getting perfused, the brain needs to compensate and tell the body there's a problem. So it will tell the body that it's not getting perfused, it's becoming ischemic, and it will tell the hypothalamus to give the sympathetic system a big drive. So the sympathetic nervous system bumps up, which causes, particularly when you know the adrenergic receptors, particularly the alpha-1 receptors, is going to go to the blood vessels of the, of the body and vasoconstrict. So all the body vasoconstricts, which, which will jump up, increase, particularly the systolic BP, because you've increased dramatically peripheral vascular resistance. So all the blood vessels are, uh, decrease. So the blood pressure increases, and you can measure that with your patients, blood pressure increases. Now, the body tries to compensate for this because it doesn't really know why the blood pressure is so high. It picks this up in the carotid bodies and the aortic arch and finds that we've got a really high blood pressure. Therefore, it feeds back to the central nervous system and tells the central nervous system to, we need to deal with the blood pressure. So we will drop heart rate. So we have a parasympathetic drive now. And so we start to get a decrease in heart rate. Another reason for maybe why this happens is we've already seen the vagus nerve being irritated with vomiting. It can also be affected to go to the heart. So in this case, we go to the GRT, but another branch goes to the heart, and that would also slow heart rate and give you bradycardia. Now, when you get that, it's going to keep the diastole more steady, but the systole's going up because we've got the vasoconstriction. So you get a widening of the, bol of the, the pulse pressure. And so that's the two parts of the triad. The third one is probably because, again, we are compressing or um, causing mechanical changes in the medulla. And located in the medulla is the respiratory center. And when you change the respiratory center or somehow um, cause an irritation to the um, respiratory center, your breathing rate's going to change. So this could be either a slowing of breathing or the breathing um, rhythm starts to become problematic. And that's the third part of the triad. So that's decrease respirations. And that's why in the, the Cushing reflex, as the ICP continues to go up, we see systolic blood pressure increasing, heart rate dropping, widening of the pole pressure, and respiratory rhythm and rate starts to become affected. So hopefully now you've understood what ICP is, 
what are some of the reasons to increase ICP? Now, when it increases, why do we get these symptoms? Hopefully now you have a better understanding of this and you can be looking out for these signs and symptoms in your patients so you can um, deal with this issue quickly.